Aloha. This show is the state of the state of Hawaii, and I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. This show is about the campaign, uh, campaigns of the election season that, of course, we've been in since January. And we're um, inviting as many guests as we can to meet the viewership of uh, Think Tech Hawaii and to learn about the process and the promises that are coming forth from these excellent candidates we have running in this election. Today, our candidate is a first time running, is first time running for uh, uh, an office in the state Senate. And his name that um, is Ian Ross. And he is, um, as I said, from district, running for District 11. And that includes uh, Manoa and Makiki and Punchbowl and Papakalea. And um, uh, we're here to, to, add, to find out what it is that he plans to seek as his goals and how he will accomplish those. And we'd also like to know how the campaign is going and what that experience is like for him, especially as a first time campaigner. So welcome Ian Ross to Think Tech Hawaii. Hello, Stephanie. Thank you so much for having me this afternoon. Well, thank you to for coming and spending some time with um with Think Tech Hawaii and its uh, viewership. And um, I'd like to start off by asking you a little bit about your local uh, history and uh, background and um, what what you think that brings what that experience you think brings to your candidacy a lot of promise. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, I was, you know, truly blessed to be born here in the islands. I was born in the district I'm running in. Uh, I grew up with my mom on Kauai. Um, I went to both public and private schools there. I attended for the beginning of college, uh, Kauai Community College, before transferring back into the district at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where I graduated with a degree in economics. Um, Throughout my you know, early adulthood, I was involved in a large number of different grassroots projects and initiatives. Uh, I'm really happy to have spearheaded the student ID bus pass for Kauai Community College, which kept it as the only college campus, to my understanding, uh, among the UH system that still doesn't have a fee or paid parking because we're able to decongest the parking lot by bringing more people onto public transportation and increasing the sustainability of the campus. Uh, I was also involved working with Mayor Bernard Cavallio as the uh, Youth Advisory Committee to the Mayor's uh, Coordinator. And we worked on a large number of different initiatives there, uh, both big and small. One of the small ones I was proud of was back then iPhones couldn't open uh, PDFs. And that meant people who wanted to, with their smartphones, check bus schedules couldn't do that. And just a really small file change uh, increased people's ability to know when the bus was coming. This was before the days that we had integration with, you know, Google Maps and those other things we now take for granted. That's so um, true. <laughs> well, you know, this is a very young uh, uh, example of service. Uh, it sounds like you were um, orienting to be of service to your community from a, a very early stage. Did, did I also see something on the website about high school work too, that you were in leadership there or? Um... Uh, sure, well, I back in high school, I was like vice president of the high school and uh, losing, a, a narrowly losing an election back in, in those days for presidency. But um, I think it goes back to my mother who uh, started her grassroots advocacy around women's rights and disability rights in the seventies when she was going to school in Washington, DC. Um, growing up, I was always brought to different community meetings. And you know, I'd often be sitting in the corner playing Pokemon on the Game Boy or something at eight or nine years old. But I very early on had my introduction to how like community meetings work and forums and how to bring people together. Uh, and as soon as uh, she could, she drafted me into being like the MC for disability rights forms and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, on Kauai. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful work. And um, thank you, mother, too. That's just <laughs> wonderful. I, I, I yesterday was Mother's Day, so I, I, I'm yes, sure yes. to give her some uh, thanks, certainly, for helping me become the man I am today. That's it. Really good point. You know, um, I want to get to your major issues, which are uh, interesting to everybody and certainly prominent um, on the list of desirable places to get some work done and make some changes and add some hope. Um, I'd like to ask you, though, 
uh, at this point, well, what is, how is the campaign going? And what is that like for a first time person? You said that you started in mid January or so towards the end of it. How did, how does it get started and how do you get some traction? Can you, can you share a little bit about what that experience was like? Absolutely. Um, with the announcement that Senator Brian Taniguchi is retiring, it was very clear to me that he was leaving big shoes to fill. Uh, he's been an excellent senator to the district for his 28 years, and he was a House representative for 14 years before that, getting his start in electoral politics uh, at a younger age than I am today. Um, when I heard that news and coming out of this pandemic, and of course we're still in it today, I saw a real urgent need for people who are connected to the community to run for office. Uh, so I went out and I announced on January 25th in front of the Father Damien statue at the Capitol. Um, that was in pretty high rates of uh, cases. So we all wore masks, we were only 10 of us, try to stay well spaced. Um, and it, while I'd considered running for office before, I certainly didn't expect it to quite look like that. But the energy was really great, and I, I felt a lot of support. And you know, we've been uh, out raising money, uh, knocking on doors, waving signs. Uh, the most recent reporting period showed that we didn't have a single dollar from a corporation or a union. Um, but for that specific filing cycle, we raised more money than any other state senate candidate through small dollar donations. 101 people have you know uh, taken some time and some effort and some of their hard earned cash. Uh, to invest in a vision for Hawaii where we can solve our homelessness crisis, have affordable homes, uh, improve education, honor kapuna and support caregivers. And um, that's been something I've just been incredibly grateful to my supporters for. Uh, but the day-to-day -day of campaigning looks like this. Uh, I throw in a little bit of sunscreen. I go out holding some walk pieces that look something like this. And I uh, knock on the doors of my neighbors and we have really frank discussions. And I found the way to start the discussion with someone who you know, hasn't met me before and where I'm trying to make a connection. I don't start by asking, what problems do you want to see fixed? Or uh, what don't you like? Or what are you mad about? That's, that's not how we have the conversation. I start with the question, what do you love about Hawaii? And we talk about the things that we care about, shared values, things we want to preserve, things we see under threat, things that we see we want to get back to. Uh, and in many cases, what we want to see improve. And time and time again, I hear just about three main issues, uh, homelessness, affordable housing, and actually crime uh, as the ones that are really affecting people's lives and are front of mind right now for the people of Manoa and Makiki. Well, that, that is just wonderful to know that you can approach people, not you personally, but that you are, sounds like you were welcome. So we still, you can still approach the door after all we've been through with this pandemic and this distancing that you, you felt like uh, you had, ac you could access it um, and people accepted you coming in. Is that the case? I'm just, I'm kind of just get the tempo of the community. They're yes, not absolutely. scary. Yeah. You know, um, and people at the door say, well, thank you for knocking on doors. It must be so hard. No one must be answering. People must be so mean to you. And honestly, no one's mean to me. I've had wonderful conversations. I think our divisive political rhetoric, I think the pain and difficulty of as a society navigating this pandemic and other things has allowed a lot of people to villainize uh, our neighbors. But our neighbors, you know, I find conservative or liberal, I'm finding uh, some bait, not always agreement on the main solutions, but these problems and the types of visions they'd like to see. And I really just think we need to get back to talking to each other. I. My theory of change is when we have a conversation, when we work together, when we know who's in office and when phone calls are answered and emails are responded to, when we bring people to the table, uh, we'll be much better positioned to solve problems. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we've seen a deterioration of the sense of community in Hawaii at the same time that we're experiencing uh, so many problems piling up in the sense that we're not getting anything done politically anymore. I don't think these are isolated incidences. And I think, again, my theory of change is, what if you had a state senator who was responsive, who was easy to reach, who left his cell phone number on the walk piece and willing to talk to you, um, 
and kept that energy while working in government to help bridge the divide between our community and government. Great. I think we'll see a lot more done. And that's what I'm trying to test. The, um, yeah, that's a communicative approach and, uh, can, and it's building community at the same time. I think that is uh, really an interesting description of it. I, I also wanted to ask you why you are running for the Senate as opposed to the, the, um, the legislature. So what can you talk to us? I say us now viewership, but I don't know that it may, everybody else may know exactly how it works here, but um, I think we could uh, profit by knowing a little bit about how you make a decision to choose an office area to work in, which section of the government you chose and why did you do that? Absolutely. Well, uh, I think the biggest piece is that we had the retirement of a really fantastic senator announced. Uh, and with that idea is that idea of big shoes to fill. And I was looking around at people who might be candidates and the types of approaches they might want to take. And I thought, you know what, I, if I have this vision of trying to bring the community together after you know, the really traumatizing divisive experience of a pandemic and politics these last few years, um, if I'm not gonna do it, who's gonna do it was one of the basic questions. Mm -hmm. But the other one is, so the retirement's what spurred it on, but also, and I hadn't mentioned this earlier, but I, I've worked in the state Senate. I've been an aide to two separate senators. I've been up close and personal seeing how the job is done. I've also worked in the state house, but it wasn't for any particular member. I was a, a bill drafter for years. So they kind of throw those people in the back room and make them uh, write and rewrite bills until the end of session. Um, but being up close and seeing how the Senate works, I think is something which is uh, a useful uh, experience. I think it's borderline a prerequisite to being able to hit the ground running. Um, and those were really big factors for me. Uh, I'll also throw in as a neighborhood board chair, I've had the opportunity to get to know the approaches of our various legislators. And I, when I considered where to run, I felt most called and I thought it was most relevant to run for the state Senate seat. Well, as a first time candidate, um, I was interested to, to know what were the levers or what the, uh, what the, the breadcrumb trail was to, toward, to, to, choosing which way to put in your effort, because I think that um, this is a very challenging uh, act to campaign for an office, right? I haven't done it, just wanting you to make sure you share, you know, with, with the community that this is really tough. You work very, very hard on canvassing and going door to door and having all of that communication and community building going on is really demanding. And you, I mean, when do you stop? I mean, it can be 24 seven, right? I mean, you have to make yourself stop. So I, I think that is really interesting. And um, so Stephanie, I, I've been, I've taken to telling people, it's like having the check engine light uh, for your body on. You don't know if you're tired, thirsty, hungry, all of this, all of the above. Uh, it's not really clear what you need to do to refresh yourself because everything just feels off. And you're right, there's not really a clear place to stop. Um, it's one of those like infinite jobs. There's nothing. You can never complete it. You can never do everything. You could never do enough. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to break down uh, the various parts and do the best you can and hope that's enough. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very daunting experience in that way, I think. But um, it's one that I found incredibly rewarding so far. Well, along that line, I also wanted to ask about the financing of it. Um, we know everybody needs um, the, the finances and the budget as big as possible, and everybody's asking for donations. But I'm, I've come around to thinking, well, wait a minute, how much is enough? I never get a sense of, and I don't know if other uh, voters do um, get a sense of how much is enough. And would they talk about the campaign chest, but that's mostly out for the, the big, the big uh, executive positions. But for this kind of uh, level of uh, office, um, which is just as important as all the rest of it, uh, I guess maybe the way to just describe it is um, the other ones are executive high level offices and these are uh, making the whole government work with them and for them and and and, and uh, working on that policy those policies through, um, but what what is it what does it take to run a campaign like yours? Well, How much money could you go? What's the most? What 
Well, give me some parameters here about how do you think about that so people just can understand it, not to reveal any intricate budget information, but just give us a sense of that. Well, first off, uh, one of the reasons I'm running is I'm, I'm very happy to give the inside scoops and let people know how uh, politics is working behind the scenes. I, I don't think uh, we're benefited when people don't know. Not to say that individuals shouldn't be allowed to have secrets or things about themselves that aren't shared, but people deserve to understand the politics. Um, well, really basically, um, the amount of money you can spend in each campaign and be useful is a changing number depending on the office on any given year. Um, but the biggest expenses for state legislative race, like the state house or the state senate, would typically be mailers. Uh, it can change a little bit on some of our uh, neighbor islands. So for example, Kauai's uh, one senate district. So it would make sense to do TV and radio because it would cover the whole area. So there's geographical considerations there. But typically, um, radio ads and print media don't give as much of an impact for some of these seats. So it ends up being things like mailers. Yes, you have to buy banners and signs and t-shirts. Those aren't usually as prohibitively expensive. Um, to mail the entire district uh, that I, uh, I'm running for, it's somewhere between six and $7,000. There's a lot of little factors that can affect that. And that means if you want to get out your message about affordable housing or how we can solve the homelessness crisis, uh, you're going to have about three to five seconds of someone's time looking at it. And to buy that time uh, costs six to $7,000. And this is one big reason why money has so much influence in politics. But like I mentioned, you know, the way I've been financing this campaign has been calling old middle school, high school, college friends and asking for contributions. And I'm letting them know about my vision for Hawaii, what I think that we can accomplish together. And uh, we've been able to bring it together on these individual bases. Um, but in a state Senate seat, uh, a corporation or a PAC uh, can write a check up to $4,000 for the state Senate. Uh, and they can do that for any given reason. Um, and it's not as tied into those personal connections often, not to say personal connections don't matter. Um, and I'd be remiss not to highlight uh, how I feel this can have a really detrimental impact on the way politics works. So for example, in the time it would take to call 40 friends and successfully get $100 contributions, someone else could you know, have one interview uh, with a corporation and get maxed out. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's particularly beneficial. Uh, I think looking at public financing systems in a more robust way is helpful, but I'm not going through the public financing system. I'm hoping that through small donors and working with organizations that I, I share a similar vision for Hawaii with, we're gonna be able to have a really strong war chest. And, and like I highlighted earlier, there are certain reporting periods. So for the January 1st to April 25th reporting period, those candidates that did report and are running for state Senate, either as incumbent or otherwise, our small dollar approach actually raised the most money. Um, and as a first time candidate, I'm really grateful uh, that I've earned the support of my friends, neighbors, and family. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. I, I, I'm sure that there's much to read about how it all works, um, uh, but I, I did want to get the essence of it, the, you know, what it is that, you know, on the ground, how it feels to be there doing, doing that. And then, of course, you have to run the staff. I mean, your mm -hmm. expenses in, in that budget. So it's bringing that money in and then you have to pay your staff and build an office situation. Right. OK. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I want to move on into your issues because um, they are laudable issues and certainly need attention. Um, but tell me a little bit about the affordable housing. You mentioned them before. I think you mentioned yes. affordable housing, homelessness. Um, you've got the population decline issue that, that's uh, adjacent to all of that. And you're also um, interested in assisting Kapuna for their mm -hmm. well-being and, and their health. And you've done some, already done some considerable work on uh, trying to get paid sick leave in place too. So I've seen those on, in your materials and those are, are laudable uh, goals for sure. Well, tell us a little bit about like affordable housing. Now I, we're working, many are working on that. Can you tell us a little bit about how you plan to robustly affect that or do something? What, what is it that you're going to uh, create that might have an effect that will be um, 
noticeable and in ways that, that we're stuck with not noticing <laughs> till now. Well, absolutely. And as you had highlighted, uh, Hawaii's population is essentially in free fall. For the past six years, we've been in population decline. Uh, we're currently at the third fastest rate of population decline. And some people see this as a good thing. They think less people on the islands, less demand, prices will go down. But I think the extreme surge in home prices, the fact that on Oahu today, it's $1.1 million for a family home, and three of the four counties are over a million dollars as well, um, should completely dispel any illusion that the solution to our problems is to wait until our neighbors give up and leave their homes. Um, we're in this together and we're gonna have to solve it together. One of the ways that we can think about uh, solving this, and it's something related to a resolution I helped pass through the Makiki Neighborhood Board as chair, uh, we supported the Aloha Homes proposal. Now, um, so we need a whole think tech, uh, a 30 minute session to break down all the Aloha homes. But let me give some basic highlights. Uh, one, these would be homes that would be only purchasable by residents. Uh, the resale value is limited. Uh, it has to be your only home. Um, you own it while you're, you're there. Uh, it's constructed by the state, uh, not by the, the state works with contractors to build on state lands in the dense urban core and along transit lines. This is to try to reduce traffic and to create density, which allows for, you know, better tax bases to support robust infrastructure and wonderful parks and things like that. Sometimes it's been referred to as a Singapore model, but it has drifted somewhat from there. But essentially you can keep our low density communities having low density. I grew up in low density communities on Kauai. Uh, it's important to me that people are able to have that. I think that's what people picture for Hawaii. Well, also we have one of the highest rates of high rises and these things can actually go together well in the sense that what you end up having is one space for one and one space for the other. And this is how you end up having low density and high density next to each other. Um, so for instance, for instance, Makiki, is that a low density? Uh, because there are lower rises there. I mean, what I if, would consider uh, Makiki to be one of the higher density communities in the state. You would, okay, um, um, okay, because of the the the, uh, it's not the height then. So it, compared, well, we, we have we have many many high rises in Makiki. In Makiki, it's it's majority low rises, but even that is somewhat is rather dense. I was just trying to get a grip on what what that uh, density issue is like. But, on but the we don't necessarily want to see Manoa Valley uh, have its green spaces paved over. I mean, that's not the right way to be going. But if you have, you know, really wonderful parks and in Makiki, we're having conversations about getting dog parks currently mm -hmm. uh, and you have all these networks, it can make density work and you can have a robust sense of community. Uh, but what you don't want to see is overly um, scaling up some of our more um, low density communities to be somewhere in between. I think that's a folly. And I think we're seeing a lot of pushes for that when really we need robust urban planning that yeah. makes these things a strength. Well, would you say that Manoa is low density? Absolutely. Because of the single family homes dominate in the area. Okay. Yes. Just to get a good grip on that's a really important point. And um, certainly um, it's a, a, new, a place that's coming up, which isn't your district, but I mean, isn't Kaka'ako like in, there are decisions that are going to be made about an area like that as and I often question, maybe we all question who is making the decisions about yes. how this thing is going. Is anybody really thinking about if they have control over whether it can be high or low density? What are they choosing? And so, so this is why I think the state needs to take a more robust role. The state yeah. has a lot of state lands. We shouldn't use the seeded lands for this um, in terms of uh, developing uh, urban areas and the trans and doing transit oriented development. Um, we end up trying to play a lot with the levers and we need to do this about getting affordable housing. But I think Kakaako is a really great example of how so much of the development in Hawaii today is not for the people who live here. Let me give you a quick uh, statistic on this. Before Kakako's more recent development, before many of the developments across the island, say in, I think the year was 2015, we hit a 10% vacant home rate, uh, which is not ideal, but it's not horrendous when you compare it to other states. We've actually gone up since then to today at 14% of the homes in Hawaii are unoccupied. 
Um, this really, I think, underscores, while we have a housing crisis, we have one of the highest rates of unoccupied homes. Um, and that is just amazing. It, it is so important. And it uh, answers my question of uh, when I've been at uh, Ala Moana Park or been there at night and turned around instead of doing the ocean view um, and focusing that way, but turned around and looked back at Waikiki in the area that you can see the lights are out and, uh, and, and that people comment on that, that there's so many so many areas of these huge condos that have no lights and that means that they're empty. People are not there. Yeah, so the everyday, everyday residents are paying the price for not us not having a robust, clear, people-centered housing policy for the state. Uh, you know, Hawaii is one of the best places if you want to take $10 million, buy a property, and just let it appreciate and, you know, get the money out of whatever country you're from. It's one of the best places for that. Uh, I think we should be one of the best places to live. I think that's the goal that we should set for ourselves, not just the best place to park money. All right, so let's go to then the process of it. So as a senator, what are the what are the means of influencing others to work with you on these issues? How do you go about developing your coalitions or how do you go about getting that legislation written? Uh, what what happens there once you're there in there? Well, the magic number in the Senate is 13. So if one senator can convince 12 other senators, that's the minimum number of votes to pass something in the Senate. So uh -huh. the, the main goal is you're going to have to work with coalitions. You're going to have to work together. You're going to have to be clear with your vision, but you're also going to have to be empathetic and understand the views and concerns of other senators. Having worked in the Senate, I at least you know, have gone to know uh, several of the senators and begun to develop those relationships. I also was the public policy manager for the Alzheimer's Association, where I brought together legislators who didn't always think of Kapuna issues, and we were able to get bills passed. We got a um, uh, bill passed to set up standards for dementia training for first responders so they could work with Kapuna well. We established an Alzheimer's coordinator position within the state government. Uh, I know the sort of the basics of it. I know we're running out of time, but you know, yeah, the basics and are just, having a one-to-one yeah. -one personal conversation, understand the visions of fellow senators, mm -hmm. highlight the problems, build a consensus, and then you start talking about solutions. And you Building don't say it's my way or the highway, but mm -hmm. you do need to be uncompromising in your fundamental values and support for the people. Otherwise, the whole thing goes haywire. But that sense of urgency, you have to be able to see that others have to share that sense of yes. urgency, or you have to make it clear about why there is a sense of urgency that they need to get with. Well, that's that's really um, very interesting and, and sounds like maybe productive. And I, in this last uh, bit of talk we can do, tell me about the outcomes that you would like to have at the end of your term of your first term. Tell us what you'd like to see has happened as a result of all the effort. Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I'm just very grateful to have been born in the best place in the world and raised here. Um, my mom and I growing up, we had to make a lot of sacrifices to make that work. Uh, definitely was working through high school. I was spending my weekends at flea markets and selling what we could in order to eat sometimes fruit and other things people would be familiar with. Um, and we really worked hard to make it work. but. The ability to do that is getting harder and harder in Hawaii. Uh, it's even more difficult than when we were facing that growing up. I'm experiencing that now. Uh, I know my neighbors are. So many people I speak to are saying they have one foot out the door and they're thinking of leaving the islands. Mm. My vision is to get back to what we love about Hawaii, to get back to being a place that cares about working families, that is a place that you can live, and more importantly, a place you can thrive. Mm. And I think. And that's the vision when I talk to voters throughout the district that it seems to be shared among all of us. We need to get back to being Hawaii again. I think that's a, a final statement, well said, and certainly shared can, as, as a, common, a common consideration and um, ideal. Um, we are um, running out of time. And is there any other statement that you'd like to make or or you, would you want to point to anything that you'd like people to think about or go to um would you like to mention the facebook page you have that people might want to see and they can find that themselves if you want them to 
Sure thing. Well, I'm really excited about the good we can do together as a district in the state. And if people want to see more about my vision or get in contact with me and share their mona'o, uh, they can go to rossforhawaii.com. That's Ross for F-O-R, hawaii.com. All of my social medias, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter accounts are all slash Ian Ross H-I, as in Hawaii. And uh, I'm looking forward to future conversations. Very good. All right. We uh, really appreciate your guesting and being so uh, forthcoming about your background and your, your, current, your current challenges and where you want to go and how you want to do it for all of us and the state of Hawaii. I appreciate your being uh, on this show, The State of the State of Hawaii, which is on every two weeks on Monday. And I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Thank you so much for your, your viewership. And we'll look forward to seeing you again. Aloha, maha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.